Welcome to Simpact Live. I'm your host, Jeff Matthews, and today I interview Anton Prenesis, VP of Strategic Partnerships for Autogrid. Autogrid provides software to utilities and others to help manage the growing complexity of the grid, and in 2022 was purchased by electrical hardware and software giant Schneider Electric. Welcome, Anton. Greetings from down under. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Greetings from Massachusetts Great. Good in the United States. My evening here. I'm in Australia. Elon Musk calls uh, EVs, yeah. re renewable power generation, and battery storage the three pillars of sustainable of a sustainable no carbon economy. Now, I, while I don't want to I, I disagree with Elon Musk and be one of those people. Um, I would my version of his three pillars is actually uh, renewable power generation, energy storage in totality, and flexible demand. And re regardless of what viewpoint you hold, it, it's clear that uh, the power generation is no longer in the hands of of, of the traditional utilities. And your CEO um, Ruben Lanes uh, uh, points out that organising the flow of uh, the, uh, this electricity is a monumental task. And he says, and I, and I quote this, it isn't about putting poles and wires, it's about optimization and efficiency. And that's where uh, I see auto grid is, is, is coming to the fore with your, with your software. And uh, firstly, a, a global question, because it is a source of frustration I see around the world, is that there are renewable energy projects being built and they can't be connected to the grid. And there's also a queue, a backup, and, and it's threatening to um, derail, if you like, the, 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 the decarbonisation of, 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 you know, a global decarbonisation. The IEA say um, it's 13 years to connect new wires on average in the OECD countries. And my first question is, can any of this be relieved with better software and better optimization, uh, or are we really talking about wires and poles for that side of it? Yeah, so these are interrelated problems. So software and optimization can certainly uh, help. Uh, we, we call um, deploying software and optimization as non-wire solutions uh, in, in lieu of uh, interconnection, right? But, but uh, the lack of interconnectivity is a growing problem, um, and it's something that will inhibit the uh, the uh, deployment of distributed energy resources, or DERs as we like to call them. And that can be everything from rooftop solar to batteries and electric vehicles, electric vehicle chargers, as well as commercial and industrial um, uh, you know, DERs. Um, you know, so I think first when it comes to interconnectivity, you know, we need to acknowledge the problem of all these delays. And, you know, the big problem on the aggregate level is if you think of large scale projects, right? If you think about, um, I don't know, like in the U.S., places like Iowa, where they call themselves the Saudi Arabia of wind, and you, know, you could put just tons and tons of wind turbines out there, or southwestern states like Nevada or New Mexico or Arizona, where they have yeah. tons of sun, right? Um, you know, the, the challenge here is we'd like to connect these big, uh, uh, you know, electricity generating regions to population centers, and without interconnection, that's going to be a problem. So, for uh, so when you think about DERs in a large scale way like that, uh, interconnectivity uh, is a huge inhibitor. Um, but then uh, also on the more regional level um, or the local level, interconnectivity also limits the value that DERs can bring to the grid. So, um, you know, one of the great things about, you know, you, could, you can look at places like Africa, you can look at other places where they don't have already have developed electricity grids and see how things like micro uh, micro grids and and you know community generation can help communities leapfrog uh, the need for large scale infrastructure um, and and that suits uh, that that's hugely that's a huge um, uh, value uh, I guess use case right uh, how do you electrify um, remote communities? Alaska, wherever. Um, but the true value proposition for DERs is to connect them back to the grid so that utilities can use those DERs to, to manage grid services. And, you know, everything from voltage regulation, frequency regulation, uh, you know, uh, uh, preventing outages, 
managing elect- uh, managing supply during times of peak demand and also controlling demand during those times right so um so so it's it's a challenge and i think that um software and optimization is certainly helpful and i think uh you know a great example of that is is uh, the virtual power plant so this is kind of um um, I think interconnectivity is uh, can be an inhibitor, but it can also be uh, a place where software can help. So, in other words, if a utility, if you just imagine um, uh, 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 rapid uptake of electric vehicles in, in in a city or a state, or let's say a utility provider's region, um, it's unrealistic for the utility to say, "Okay, we're going to build out enough capacity so that everybody who owns an electric vehicle can arrive home at the same time and charge their electric yeah. vehicle for those same eleven hours." Um, you know, and, and there's so many variables here because now people work at home more, so maybe that scenario isn't as big as it would have been, you know, pre-pandemic. But that being said, it's it's unrealistic, um, and it's 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 expensive. I mean, so I mean, why are there inter interconnection delays? The main, well, not the main reason, but one of the huge reasons is cost. You know, back in um, the late 70s and 80s, when everybody was buying air conditioners, uh, utilities were building out. Um, you know, peaker plants and, and more transmission and distribution lines to accommodate all of that demand. Um, hmm. We can't have a repeat of that, you know, and, and then if you look at the, uh, you know, all the demand that's being fueled by things like the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States and just other incentives around the world, um, the, the uptake of EVs and solar and everything else is, 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 is probably going to outpace what we saw with, say, air conditioners, right? So you match that quick uptake with the slow pace of government to actually, you know, uh, get um, per, you know, permits uh, uh, through the the permitting machine and so forth. Uh, that's a problem, um, and it's also made complicated by all the all the the huge number of different stakeholders involved. You know, so you know <clears throat> you've got state and local governments, you've got local communities, and there are issues about you know running power lines through communities and, and other areas. There's wildfire threats now we have to think about well will a new transmission and distribution line you know set off the next massive uh wildfire um you know there are also some ironic kind of uh conflicts arising yeah. now like among ecologists so conservationists you know who are focused on protecting endangered species and ecosystems versus climate uh you know activists who want to push for faster electrification um and then Another irony, I think, is, um, you know, there's the equity issue on the on the one hand and then the NIMBY issue on the other. So traditionally, power lines have gone, you know, disproportionately through poor, disadvantaged communities. Uh, that's an issue. But then on the flip side of it, you know, a lot of wealthier people don't want the, you know, don't want their view spoiled, for instance, by by infrastructure. So there's a whole lot of things that you know are are making interconnectivity a real issue, and uh, and I think on the policy level, it's important for you know uh, you know one of the compromises that was made uh, recently in the U.S. was to allow uh, permitting for a natural gas pipeline, uh, you know, and and that's that's an issue for a lot of people who are concerned about decarbonization. But we have to be creative about that. But to your point, yes, software and optimization uh, can be a huge. Um, uh, uh, so, I, well, solution to the problem or an alternative to building out uh, all this infrastructure. Because if you can intelligently, on the demand side, manage demand such that it's, um, you, you know, during peak periods, not not all of your customers are, are demanding response at the same time with demand response programs and yeah. things like that, that's really important. And then on the supply side, if you can tap into DERs as a source of, of electricity with virtual power plants, for example, uh, that's also a so, big so part of the solution. Pick up- one point about electric vehicles, uh, because yeah, we, it's what I call batteries fighting batteries. Where you can't have EVs will dramatically um, be larger. There'll be ninety percent of all the batteries on Earth will be EVs. So you've got to have a look at ninety percent of of all the batteries available to help um, shave peak loads will be actually EV batteries. And connecting those in a smart way with software and, and optimization, it just has to be in everyone's thinking. Um, is it in companies like yours thinking about how we get those EV batteries to actually 
uh, support the grid and not um, tip it over because they, they will. They'll, 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 they'll be nobody will be able to top up all the batteries from theirs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are two ways to look at it. One is through um, the lens of a residential EV owner, and the other is through fleets. You know, whether it's fleets of delivery trucks, uh, mail vehicles, or school buses. You know, there there are are ways to um, it, it's, to utilize those batteries on wheels as a way to um, uh, you know provide uh, grid stabilization and and you know. Um, additional uh, supply. So I think um, it's easier to think about it uh, in terms of fleets. Uh, and, and the reason why is because a fleet of vehicles, for one, has a lot more aggregate, um, uh, you know, megawatts or, or kilowatts, so a lot more power. And, you know, an example that is a company that we're working with in California called Zoom. That's Z-U-M. Yeah. U with a little line over it, so you pronounce it correctly. Uh, but basically, they're a um, they call themselves a transportation uh, services or uh, transportation energy services provider or something. But essentially, what they do is they they enable the electrification of school bus fleets, and 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 the model there is you know one um, it's one of the benefits of fleets is uh, you know when they're going to be on the road. You know how much of a charge they're going to need to complete their route uh, for each individual bus, and all of that, all of that can be optimized in, uh, with a software platform, so that when the vehicles are at their charging depot, uh, they get the right amount of charge at the right time. So, you know, uh, one of the use cases there is time of use charging. Uh, another is demand charge management. Those are kinds of the same things. Uh, in demand charge management, you're optimizing for the price of electricity so that uh, a school, uh, school district can uh, optimize to charge their buses when electricity is cheap. Uh, time of use is similar, but, um, you know, again, uh, you can optimize for different things as well. Do you want to ensure that you're using clean energy as much as as possible, um, uh, and 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 that might help you meet your ESG goals, for example. Um, so, uh, so with school bus fleets, it's it's going to you know the usage is typically during the day, um, and then. Uh, almost not at all during the summer. So during the summer, you've got this big captive um, battery, uh, yeah. uh, you know, army just sitting there. And and then you could think about using that for uh, to aggregate all of that for a virtual power plant, right? So if a uh, a utility can tap into that aggregate uh, capacity, and uh, you know when there's a time of peak demand, instead of firing up yes. a natural gas powered peaker plant, um, you can utilize this clean energy from from the from the bus batteries, well, that that ben that benefits everyone. I mean, I think the the um, the peaker, like I guess, eliminating peaker plants or 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 you know or reducing our dependence on them is huge. I think it was estimated that in the U.S., uh, utility rate payers pay something like ten billion dollars a year for the upkeep and 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 operations of peaker plants and and all of that is paid through your electricity bill to the utility now if the utility can return some of that to you uh as as a um well now we use the word uh now that we're now that auto grid is part of schneider yes. we use the word prosumer a lot right which is basically to mean that you know you can consume energy but if you have batteries and things like that you can uh, produce energy if if a utility can return some of that 10 billion dollars to uh you know writ large across the US to ratepayers uh then that's that's a real benefit uh, you know their customers will be happier especially given how the price of electricity has gone up but so that's the fleet use case it's easy to manage it's easy easier to manage easier to schedule easier to aggregate the residential uh, EV charger uh, charging use cases is, is is a little bit more complex because it's um you know both of these are edge use cases but in a residential case i think of it as really at the edge right because you've got all these little yeah. um you got individual cars um what makes them uh what makes them i guess suitable for optimization is that all of these ev chargers are, are controlled by apps and 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 so each individual car owner can 
customize their experience to say, um, hey, you know what? I only need 50% of my battery tomorrow yes. uh, to get back and forth from work. So overnight, I want to make my battery available for uh, either demand response in my own home or for a virtual power plant, um, uh, maybe if it's in my community, uh, to the grid. And, and I'm going to give the grid control or the utility company control over my battery so that it can be utilized that way. Uh, I think yeah. it's, it's, it's a huge opportunity. Uh, and, and it's also an important one because up until very recently, EVs were viewed as nothing but a problem. You know, back in the early days, you know, people were blowing out their neighborhood transformers when they drove home with their new EV. And, uh, and, and utilities were understandably very um, resistant to, 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 to this. But now I think uh, they're seen as a necessary evil and maybe so, uh, something that could benefit back in 2016, I predicted that to you. EV of the future would buy and sell power for you while you were at work or while you were sitting at home, and, and essentially you'd get a free ride because it would connect to the grid. And, and I'm hoping this comes true, so I'm not proven wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I have yet to make the uh, the, uh, the 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 pl to take the plunge and get an EV, yeah. but I think so, my next so car. Let me let me turn at least auto grid, um, because. <laughs> As a company, you've been going uh, 13 years, but you were bought by Schneider Electric last year, which um, will become one of the big, big one of the biggest companies on the planet, I would assume, because it's so embedded in every electricity network and in everybody's home. We have so many devices and uh, for Schneider Electric, so. That must have been a big deal for AutoGrid. They must have seen obviously something in in your um, in your software and optimization software that they thought that they could um, use, utilize, take forward, and help their. I see their share market prices is still going up and up and up, and 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 hopefully you've contributed to that. So let's talk about. AutoGrid's core products and what you do. I know that there's some great acronyms in there. It's DROMS and DERMS, and, and we've talked a bit about virtual power plants. But sort of how what 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 do you enable people to do? Because um, that, that's really because we're all looking for solutions because there's a whole lot of problems out there. And you know what does AutoGrid bring bring to the table to help us? Yeah, sure. Yeah, and and you mentioned the acronyms, and uh, I only recently entered this space. Uh, prior to this, I was working. I've always been in um, uh, computing and, and IT, but uh, prior to this, I was focused on telecom. So when I went from just doing programming and, and computer storage and, and and everything else, I thought I knew all the acronyms. Then I shifted to focus on telecom, and I was like, you know, pretty overwhelmed by all the acronyms there. But I have to say, I've never seen more acronyms than I've seen in in the utility industry. It's uh, it's I, I have, I'm waging a personal <laughs> war to try to describe things in in plain English, or at least English, because I think that even once you get to English, the, the it, everything's so very complex that it, it's hard to do it in plain English. But yeah, so. Our product and AutoGrid was founded in 2011, and and um, and so our core product is our platform. It's it's a SaaS platform. It's cloud native, and um, you know, and 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 it it basically runs. I, I guess I would call the, the 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 engine of the platform to be our predictive optimization layer. That's where all the magic happens. You know, we can we can. So I'll say ML and AI because you have to say that, but we actually it, it actually is driven by machine learning. You can't. That's that's how optimization happens, and that's how um, we can customize use cases for specific customers. But yeah, so the auto grid platform uh, in the early days, the focus was demand response, uh, or you see the acronym DROMS, which is demand response operating management system, and um, and one of the things that uh, makes auto grid unique to this day is that um, a lot of companies that you see uh, in this space are either focused on residential or commercial and industrial, uh, and, um, and we, we, we tackle both. And uh, so for demand response, in a nutshell, is a customer, I'm not going to say prosumer, because right now we're just talking about demand, 
a customer, uh, you know, enters into an agreement with your utility to uh, provide some relief uh, during times of high demand. And that can be done either manually or in an automated way. Uh, in the manual scenario, uh, you enter into a demand response program and you say, you'll accept a text message or some other notification from a utility to say, hey, turn down your air conditioner two degrees over the next four hours or, um, you know, or something along those lines. It's voluntary. Uh, you can opt to do it or not. Um, if you do it, AutoGrid, so what does AutoGrid do in this scenario, right? We help utilities design the program. We help utilities uh, look into their install base and say, okay, who has smart meters uh, if smart meters are required? For behavioral demand response, smart meters aren't necessarily required, but who among uh, the customer base would be eligible for a program? And then we help uh, utilities reach out to those customers and, and, and recruit customers into the program. And then once their customers are in the program, uh, in, in the behavioral case, we enable the utility to send the message out to all the customers saying, hey, take this action. And then measurement and verification for the utility to understand who actually took the action so that uh, afterwards they can get whatever the incentive might be. It could be a reduction on their utility bill the next month. It could be a gift card. It could be uh, any number of things. That's up to the utility. And then in the automated case, uh, a customer, and this could be a homeowner. It could be a, uh, a business owner or a restaurant, a hotel, what have you. It says, okay, uh, I'm going to allow the utility to take control of either my smart meter or a water heater or a battery, an EV charger. And, and I'm going to you know, set the parameters under which they can control it. And, and then, you know, so an example with a hot water heater might be uh, I want to optimize for price. I, I want to use electricity when it's cheapest. The uh, utility can say, all right, well, based on the prediction of the price over the next day, over the next five days that AutoGrid does, um, it will be economical for me to heat my water now when electricity is cheap and then turn off the heat. And, you know, and, and, and yeah. hot water is going to stay hot for a few hours. So you you can kind of uh, do some arbitrage there to use a fancy term. But I mean, that's kind of demand response and that's really managing demand. And back when AutoGrid was founded, that was the big use case, um, you know, and and as time has gone on, we've moved and, and you can look, we've got DROMS, we've got DERMS, we've got VPPs. Those are the three big acronyms. So, so from DROMS, you can look at DERMS. And what does that mean? Distributed Energy Resource Management System. And, uh, and really that's just um, kind of, uh, uh, um, an evolution of what demand response is because you're still managing the same distributed energy resources, maybe slightly more, uh, different kinds. Maybe you're doing front of the meter, large scale batteries, for example. Uh, but what DERMS does, it enables again, the utility to treat these, uh, aggregations of, of, um, energy assets in ways that can benefit uh, things like frequency control, voltage control, uh, you know, outage prevention, uh, all the things that uh, sometimes are referred to as ancillary services, uh, and and to 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 basically uh, utilize those distributed energy resources for the grid, and at the same time for the for the asset owner, what Derms plays into the microgrid use case. I mentioned microgrids, and and really, what is that? That's a, an isolated um, collection. Of of one or more distributed energy resources that powers maybe a college campus or or a, a, a couple of maybe a hotel or 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 community. Um, so the microgrid provides resiliency when the larger grid is out, but it can also be a distributed energy resource itself and play into that uh, in, in, into the utility uh, or into the grid. I'm sorry. Um, and then virtual power plants is an extension beyond that to really think about large scale aggregations of DERs. And, you know, once again, utilities can use those for grid management, but in more and more markets uh, around the world. So in, in the U.S., you've got KISO in California, ERCOT in Texas, uh, PJM in um, the South East, uh, ISO New England, uh, and others where there are actual markets where you can trade a uh, wholesale markets where energy is traded. And, uh, these aggregations, um, either through an aggregator or some other market trading mechanism can, uh, bid the megawatts that are aggregated into these markets and, yep. and make some money, uh, by trading. So auto, so that they're going back to the product itself, our platform enables all of that. And, and when we talk to customers, we're not 
we're not selling different products like here's our demand response product or here's our vpp product we're basically um we're we're much more consultative and we work with customers to understand their use case and 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 how they can use our platform and deploy our platform to actually uh, accomplish that use case so i hope that's a good and description what, what, uh, of what, what size of companies and utilities do you have um your average user, I mean, you're obviously not um, utility scale or businesses. Um, how small down does it go? How big does it go? Who would come knock on your door? Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if I can give an average just because um, that's because I don't know. I don't have that data in my head. But what I can say is that we go from really small to really big. So uh, re an example of really small would be a co-op. Um, so NRTC is, uh, you know, uh, uh, the National Rural, um, basically it's a collection of rural co-ops, which are small, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 usually community um based uh, uh utility consumers and and those could be you know in you know the the, the small numbers say 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 the thousands uh maybe even you know uh and, and we have no problem going small at the same time we can go really big so an example is clp in in um uh in, in in hong kong where we have the largest behavioral demand response program in the world with uh, six hundred thousand customers uh participating and we did an event last year where we were able to you know what i described earlier uh, uh enable clp to send um, uh, a behavioral response event out to their uh six hundred thousand customers and 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 measure uh, the 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 effect of it and and it was a success. They're looking to grow to um, to wow. three million this year. Um, so so we run the gamut and um, and I I should also point out too that not all of our customers are utilities. So we also sell to um, more acronyms IPPs uh, individual uh, power producers and 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 similar kinds of companies. So an example there. Yep. would be Total Energies in France, where uh, we're helping them trade. Uh, 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 I think it's like, I think it's one point three gigawatts of uh, renewable energy. So uh, using uh, front of the meter batteries. So uh, Total Energies, the the amount of megawatts that they're trading into the um, the ancillary markets, the frequency reserve markets, I think it is in France, represents a third of the total capacity in France. Um, and then we're doing something similar in Australia uh, with Shell Energy. So, um, you know, uh, you know, so uh, Shell Energy is an example of what we call our first uh, mixed asset portfolio uh, uh, for VPPs uh, in the sense that we're including solar storage and uh, electric vehicle chargers. And 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 enabling Shell as the energy producer prosumer to um, to uh, profit or benefit from multiple value streams. So, so we call it a mixed asset multi market VPP. Uh, and so what they're doing is uh, and and they're based in South Wales and, and Victoria, um, and they're managing commercial industrial building management systems and HVAC systems and making those available for um, for VPP uh, uh, aggregations. Oh, that, that's utilities. one of that was one of my questions. Uh, are, are you coming into Asia Pacific? Obviously, you're in Hong Kong and, and the biggest in, in the world. You said uh, Sing Singapore could probably have used your your, uh, your technology recently they're, they're having a, a hard time here but um has schneider electric got plans for auto grid to, to to go global to push you global yeah i mean we already are going global and and it's interesting because when you when you describe schneider electric um you know you mentioned um you know yeah the electric part right you know so so uh, you know the uses of you know switches and transformers and and all of the hardware and, and various software you know because uh because uh, in addition to auto grid you know schneider has adms which is used by utilities to control their grid uh in aggregate uh you know uh gis systems for uh, managing the infrastructure and vegetation management and all that good stuff um but outside of 
the electric world, Schneider's got an enormous portfolio of buildings that are managed by Schneider Electric Building Management Systems. They've got a large portfolio of um, industrial automation across all different kinds of industry verticals, um, as well as uh, secure power. So, you know, data center UPSs and things like that. Uh, so, so, so everything I've described up until this point with utilities and, you know, Demand response, DERMS, VPP, we're already going global with um, with Schneider Electric. But the, the the massive opportunity that we see is being able to tap into that install base of buildings and hotels and you know factories or you know whatever these things are in Schneider's larger customer base. Right. So yeah, they're very much plans to, to take off. Uh, yeah, Schneider Electric are sponsors of um, sustainable industrial manufacturing Sim Europe. Um, and um, I'm hoping to I'm hoping to get them bo on board for Simpac here here in Australia for Sustainable Industrial Manufacturing Asia Pacific, and um, it looks like I'm going to Netherlands in November to um, to actually host a show up there where where the, they'll be um, uh, they'll be uh, um, sponsors. So. Um, yeah, ho hopefully I can I can talk to them uh, while, while I'm up there in November. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. If you want to talk to anybody sooner, I'll, just let I'll, me know. I'll do that. Look, um, it's fantastic chat. I I, I learned a lot. Um, I'm really grateful that you come on the show, and um, I'll look out for AutoGrid and um, and we know that you guys are doing important work. We know that this energy transition can't be done without these acronyms. You know, with it, 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 it can't. We just can't figuratively come home and turn the light switches on when we want to. That those days are over, and that's for businesses and industries and everything else. And um, the IEA is predicting that demand side response will be 25% of all energy storage uh, and 25% will be in batteries. Um, I actually think that's going to be bigger. I, 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 I think because I, I include batteries as demand response because you can only top them up from excess. And once they're depleted, you can't you can't keep you know. So they're actually part of the demand response mechanism, and we know that um, we're going to need smart people and smart uh, computerization and, and maybe some AI to um, to make this thing work to keep to keep it all together. Yeah, and it's not just uh, yeah. I agree with you on batteries, and it's also important to note that batteries are what make solar and wind and all of these intermittent energy sources dispatchable right? because that batteries are what provide the the predictability you know clearly and also uh you know as grids look at um uh, uh decommissioning um, you know large spinning things large spinning metal things that that typically regulate the frequency on the grid batteries are the uh the, the, and the probably thing that's going to replace those yeah, and and one of the things for industry, yeah. which I I've sort of been preaching um, internationally for a long time now, is that the energy transition uh, there is great opportunity for industry if it learns how to use the power when it's freely available, and especially because we're going to produce lots of excess power, and that's as big a problem as you know as not having enough. Um, uh, and if they learn to modulate their energy use uh, industry itself. Then there should be good opportunities and um, things that, uh, like today, we, we're finding, or especially in the UK, that, that the latest figures have been released on how much um, wind was wasted, uh, you know, how much money was paid to, to to switch them off. That to me is jobs and export dollars just blowing past. It's the biggest waste of natural resources on the planet is turning a wind farm off today, especially when we're still burning fossil fuels. So. All of that's going to require, as I said, you know, companies like yours to 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 be able to to help with this a solution. So, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's uh, been great chatting. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Okay. I enjoyed it. <laughs>